Hey, Wade, how you doing? Life is good, Rob. How, uh, how's yourself? Doing good. You got to send me some of that life, life is good juju. I could use some of that. So we're now on episode five, brother. And, you know, before we go on, we started 11-11, auspicious time. I'm chilling from my living room right now. And I just wanted to say thank you right now to Dude Wade for being my co-host on this. But also thank you to all the amazing, amazing guests that we have had on this show so far. I mean, it's been nothing less than game changing from tarot masters to um, martial arts occultists to Enochian mages. The stuff that they're filling out, man, is just changing the game. What do you think about the last few episodes, Wade? You know, honestly, it's been really chewy. Um, I've, I've been, you know, right here in the middle of these and I'm thinking every time it's like, wait, it's it's already, we're done? We could go another hour, two hours with some of this stuff. There's a totally. lot to digest in this. Totally agree. So, you know, as the great musical poet, Henry Rollins, Sir Henry Rollins says, he has two ways of listening to music. One is what we call protein listening, where he slowly chews on the music. And the second is called carbohydrate, where it's something he likes and it burns easy. And I think, Wade, you and I have had enough of the protein episodes. These have been slow digesting, good for the body, muscle building, but kind of heavy stuff. Do you agree? You know, yeah, that's it. We, we can go a little lighter. Yeah. So today, I couldn't have thought of anybody better to have on our fifth episode than a dear friend of mine. Now, it's funny. I call this episode The Laughing Magician because I got that from Constantine, but it is our Constantine, if you're one of those people. And it talks about a magician who found his power through laughter. And this is actually one of my only friends who practice the occult, who's also a stand-up comedian as well. Now, I'm a frustrated comedian. I think the only thing comical about me is my face. But in this episode, I am honored to have a friend who I've known since my early days as an author. Uh, he is an advocate of the LGBT lifestyle. Um, at the same time, he is a practitioner of several things from magic to psalms to magical squares to even um jewish mysticism he really has gone around the, the block with his practices but last but not least he is a performing comedian and it is with great honor and it is with great ado to introduce our very first carbohydrate guest my dear friend magical comedian the laughing magician david stolowitz david welcome to the show good morning guys how are you doing? Morning. Great. Doing great. Good morning, David. Welcome to Magic.TV, where we wake you up to give you a bad day. So tell us a little bit about yourself, David. I mean, this is a show by occultists for occultists, and we want to know more about you as a practitioner before we get to the magical side of it. I mean, the, the not magical, the comedy side of it. And then I'd like to also know later on about how you've combined the two, if you have it at all. So talk to me about your practices, Dave. I think um, I was in college in the early 2000s. I was living in the North Bay, and I read Donald Michael Craig's um, 11 Steps with the Pentagram. You remember? Modern that? magic. Modern yeah. magic. Yeah. I think Sunday. literally everybody got in ceremonial magic got started with that book. <laughs> yeah, I yep. feel sentimental about it now. Especially now that he passed away. So that's what got you started. But like... Um, so what, what was it about that book that caught your attention? You know, I was on a Celtic kick at the time. Yeah, I listened to Enya all the time. It was ridiculous. <laughs> okay, and then? Yeah. And, you know, there. when I was a kid, I was a romantic. I read The Mists of Avalon, and, uh, you know, I, I was interested in Celtic mysticism and European history and all that, so... I read a lot. I read really voraciously. Um, yeah. And uh, I just uh, gobbled everything up because I was hungry for knowledge. I was trying to figure out who I was and where I belonged in the world and what was right, what was wrong, how was a person supposed to tell. Um, you know, it's like I've been doing a lot of inner work lately, and I feel like with my whole life, there's been this stress towards discernment. Like that's the skill my soul is trying to get down. That and, sounds interesting. Uh, talk to me about that. I mean, what is yeah. for the viewers? Talk to me. What is discernment? 
Okay, so discernment is, uh, spiritually speaking, the ability to tell between the truth and falsehood, um, mm -hmm. uh, clear seeing, you know, with the, the inner light, the inner mind, the spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, when you see those symbols for the third eye, like the eye of Horus and stuff, you know, that's yes. discernment. It's the same thing. So you have to be able to tell truth from falsehood or uh, you can end up going to hell, you know, in this world or the next. And by that, I just mean the chain of suffering, um, mm -hmm. negative cycles, you know, the soul gets stuck. Well, again, you, you have to know the truth. I mean, whether yeah. or not you tell the truth is a whole different, that's, that's a personal choice, but you have to know the truth for yes. yourself. Yes, no, will, dare, and shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> it's a way of going about it. Well, I was bad with that. I have been really, really bad with my tongue. And, you know, the Bible and the Quran both say that's a no-no because you got to watch out. Words have power. And, uh, you know, it's not so much what you say as how you say it, the intent, the spirit you put into it. Um, so I have really abused my uh, my language before. You know, I've committed the sin of blasphemy. Blasphemy is Greek. It means um, slander, to slander God. Really? Um, yeah. So, so that's what it's about. It's like um, all of Christianity is about spiritual discernment. And I got into uh, the teachings of St. Ignatius of not Loyola when Lo I was in Loyola, college. Yeah. yeah. And uh, St. Ignatius is called upon by a lot of spiritual workers because they're looking for that, that certainty. It's the same thing that St. Paul talked about. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to magic, that's, you know, a key so you don't get lost in superstition or mm -hmm. really negative dark spirits that suck all your energy and point you in the wrong direction. Because um, I have a friend, her name's uh, Iris Benson. She's a comedian here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And she jokes and says it's not enough to just be spiritual because there's bad spirits too. And I think we have to be honest about that, that not every being out there in the universe you know, is full of friendly energy towards humanity. There's a lot of them that actively resent us. They're True. still bitter about being replaced in the cycle of evolution. And they've held on to that bitterness. And they can really destroy our lives if we let them run amok. And there's nothing cool and trendy about that. We have a well, friend. It's not just, there's also, there's also there's spirits out there that just don't give a shit about humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like walking out in the woods. A bear doesn't hate humans. Humans are tasty, <laughs> yeah. but if you go out there in the woods, you could run into a bear, and it's not his fault, you know, that that you put yourself in that position. Yeah. So yeah, running so, the spirits around the universe, maybe they don't actively resent humans, but maybe they don't regard you as anything more than an ant either, or a meal. Yeah. Or meal. Yeah. So it's like I learned the hard way, you guys, because I summoned all kinds of spirits. I. I, I was lonely for many years, to be honest. I was very... So instead of going on a date, you summoned demons. And no wonder. <laughs> so you were lonely yeah. and you summoned demons. Yeah, like and they did create a lot of problems. It's true. Like, I got them to do some things for me, but there was always a catch to it because of the place it was coming from, mm -hmm. the need for power and control. Um, you know, it's like uh, in the Lord's Prayer, you know, we say the power belongs to God. Because if you don't do that, it, the, the nefesh, the energy, the passion, it gets caught up and makes a big mess. Mm -hmm. It's like only the, the collective consciousness can handle that burden. Um, so it's like when we're praying for forgiveness, uh, like the words mean releasing a burden. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. So I've been trying to focus on that lately. Um, like I'll tell you with the grimoires, I read a lot of them, Rob and Wade. Um, I think the most profound experiences I had were with um, the Arbitel of Magic and uh, the book of Abermelon. Whoa. And the Arbitel was really interesting because it goes into this whole system of philosophy that was popular in the Renaissance. Um, and uh, the Olympic spirits are interesting spirits, like they're spirits that are part of evolution. I see them kind of like the, the Hindu rishis, the seven sages. You know, like the stars up there, um, usually they're called the Seven Sisters, but in different cultures, they have different names, you know. But um, alchemy, I think that was tied into it because um, when they talk about Olympic spirits, it's like um, the role 
the things are playing in evolution at any given point. And, and, you mm -hmm. know, it's like the, the planets are symbols for those, but, uh, yeah, I interacted with some of those and it changed my life. Like, uh, I went up on the mountain here, uh, Mount Madonna, and I called the spirit Aratron and, uh, you know, it was like a full moon and there were cub scouts camping and, uh, I, I just had this experience of connection to, mm -hmm. uh, humanity to my elders and my juniors and the the chain of things and uh you know i could see myself in these kids running around remember what that was like and it put things in perspective for me and it's uh it's become something you know close to my heart you know to care about people um our our young people and our elders and those you know with disabilities and that's why mm -hmm. i ended up becoming a caretaker i think um, during the pandemic, I took care of my friend who was very sick. He lived about two years. He died in uh, February. Um, yeah, his name was Dave Garrett. He was a comedian and a mm -hmm. skateboarder too, a master skateboarder. Cool. Very cool guy. Um, he bumped into Brian Callen by accident while he was bombing down Sunset Boulevard on a skateboard. Mm -hmm. It was pretty badass. <laughs> Wait, talk to me. You were specific mentioning a lot about prayer and it seems to be uh -huh. Judeo-Christian in nature. What was your original upbringing with regards to disbelief? Were you with the Catholic faith? Were you with something else? Were you with Jewish faith? I mean, like, what uh -huh. was your original start with this? Okay, well, I was raised in uh, Reformed Judaism, uh, you mm -hmm. know, a pretty liberal branch. Um, mm -hmm. And my dad married, you know, a Catholic lady. Um, my mom is Scottish Catholic. Look at the look on his face the minute he said Catholic. Hey, I'm Catholic, dude. He's like, yeah, you married a Catholic. He's like, dude. Well, you know, I, mean, I never went to Catholic church growing up. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm kind of glad because it seems like there's some pedophilia and sadomasochism going on that's a bit disturbing. So I don't think that has anything to do with the teachings of Christ. I think that's leftovers from Roman culture. They're demons. <laughs> yeah. And, like, how did you start reconciling your... Uh, your beliefs went with the magical practices when you started, because it seems you admitted you got a pretty strong aspect of faith in your practices. Yeah. Well, God is essential to me. I never, okay. I did abandon God, but I came back. Uh, um, like, yeah. Um, Kabbalah was my background. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, in the, the nineties and the two thousands, the Kabbalah center in Los Angeles was very big. And my dad was into it and he bought a bunch of the books and I had read other stuff, but it was more from like Western mystery tradition. Mm -hmm. Like you can tell which Kabbalah they're talking about by the way they spell it. You yeah. Know that? <laughs> yeah. So like if it's Hebrew, it's spelled one way. If it's like um, Western stuff, it's spelled another. And then there's the Christian spelling. So I explored all the different branches and I was really interested in the practical Kabbalah. I read all the books of Gershom Sholem. The, the mm -hmm. Kabbalistic scholar. Did you yeah. ever read him? Yeah. 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 And it was really interesting because they would take numbers and names and letters and they would create matrices out of them like programmers do. Mm -hmm. They would create combinations. That's basically so gematria, would, right? Um, gematria was one way to do it. Yeah. But it's like it's a little more than gematria. They, yeah. they go into that a lot in Suffering at Sierra, how to basically program it, like like almost creating circuit paths. Yeah. And so it's like I, I live here by Silicon Valley, and it's the same mindset. They're doing the same kinds of things. I, I, I found that connection here. I'm not a programmer. I, I find it kind of boring, but that's because I, I have difficulty focusing, you know, mm -hmm. into that, that box. Mm. The box is important, though. I opened the box, and let them all out and it's been a mess um yeah oh that's that's a real thing i got into faustian magic in grad school big do share wait. okay please yeah. share about it. before you go any further can you move a little bit to your right because i'm getting only yeah. half your there you go we need to see your good looking face all right there you go so please <laughs> faustian magic that's a first share i'd like to hear about this okay so yeah um thirty thousand dollars went to the toilet. <clears throat> that was awful for what a bunch of amulets and talismans and evil spirits that ruined my life yeah so i uh, called up this demon named barbuel 
and uh, he was supposed to make me a master of arts. And yes, I suppose he's been doing that the hard way. But, you know, he wrecked chaos. You know, the, those those demons are really evil. They're called the electors. They mm -hmm. actually go back to Sumerian culture. They're in the Necronomicon, too. You can notice some of the names are, are similar or even the same. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so there was this book called The Black Raven. And originally, it was in the the sixth and seventh book of Moses. It was part of that big collection. That that thing always seemed like a jumbled up magazine, didn't it? Like random yeah, it does. Yeah. from three centuries. It, just well, I don't think Moses it. wrote it for starters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we I don't think that. Was <laughs> right there. It doesn't look like the King of Solomon. Like, Everybody yeah. knows that King Solomon Moses is really from ancient you know? Ireland or something. No, 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 of course not. So it it was just like they were doing their thing, but um. Yeah, I was involved in hoodoo in college. I uh, worked at Lucky Mojo in Forestville in the North Bay with Caddy Rowan. You worked you work with yeah. that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's right oh. down the road from here. Oh, cool. So you're up in the North Bay now? Uh, I'm up in the Redwoods. Nice. Nice. I love it up there. Yeah. Way the hell up in the middle of nowhere. It, it's my Dago Bar. Oh, cool. This is where sure. Jedi wait, go wait, to wait, disappear. Before we go any further, somebody's asking me on the private line, how did you get started into Faustian magic? How did it find its way to you? Somebody texted me right now to ask about that. Okay, so like it was an appendix to the, the magic books of Moses. And, um, you know, they were talking about there was a Catholic pope who practiced black magic. Uh, Honorius, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I think all the popes did. Yeah, I think they all no, did, but no, like, that's not true. Like a lot of them just weren't into it at all. And there mm -hmm. were a couple that were into white magic. Honorius of Thebes, um, his grimoire was very good. He had interesting perfume collections. I like <laughs> the oil. Anyway, um, so yeah, I uh, I was into this because of kind of a fixation. I'll, it's, it was a fetish, if I'll be honest, and I'll leave it at that. But sometimes um, there's certain spirits that they'll use sex as a means to try to control you. And they can fill you with so much pleasure, but they'll give you a lot of pain to go with it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, the thing was with these spirits, it, it said that the goal with calling them was to gain the, the power of earth and water, those two mm -hmm. elements in particular. Waters always come naturally to me. I don't have issues with it, but earth was a real big one. Um, in the legend of Dr. Faust, when he first goes to summon... He's trying to call up the spirit of the earth, but he gets Astaroth instead, and it goes south from there. But the intention is that I was looking for grounding in my own mm -hmm. life with my own mind. So I've had attention deficit disorder, basically, okay. my whole life. I was never formally diagnosed, but I've read enough and known the signs to know it was a constant issue. And, you know, I would get hooked on weed as a way to deal with that a way to focus my consciousness or spread it out if I needed to. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was fearful. I was very fearful when I got into magic. And so I called up a lot of dark stuff because I was trying to face my fears, trying to overcome them. Sometimes I was successful. Sometimes I wasn't. But I believed in the that warrior ethos. I mm -hmm. think that match I have to practice. Um, I called up the Olympic spirit, Falig, the martial one. I mean, phallic. That's just another way to say it. Yeah, phallic, phallic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you called you know, up the phallic. Okay, good one. I mean, says a lot about your preferences, but please continue. Yeah, but um, I was into Castaneda and that whole uh, ethic. And, uh, you know, for a while it went away, but it was okay. Like, so Carlos Castaneda, the real life person, and then like his stories and his books were two different people. Like, it, oh, he way different. Off. Yeah, he ripped off a lot of stuff from native people and he passed it off as his own or as like the Don Juan character was kind of a composite mm -hmm. from what yeah. people have pieced together. Yeah. But, you know, the those teachings of Don Juan, I mean, he's gone on and collected a bunch of stuff. And yeah, that's, I mean, like, that's that's master, yeah. That. yeah, but it's like they were beautiful and profound teachings. They just didn't come from him. And he himself went mad. You know, he got on an ego trip and he started like abusing women and like a lot yeah. of these spiritual gurus do. These false gods. Yeah. That in the the Kabbalah, in the dark side, on the other side of the tree, the highest order of demons is the pseudothei, the false gods. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Belial's one of them, actually. Yeah. So there's um, an infernal hierarchy, and they talk about that in the book. Um, with the seven electors, the spirits that Dr. Faust works with, um, electors were a system in medieval Germany. Um, the Germans had kind of um, a federation, what we would call it at the time. Yeah. Like there was conflict, especially like when the, the Hundred Years' War broke out. But different regions of Germany would come together as a conclave to confirm who the emperor would be, mm -hmm. the emperor of the German Empire. And so um, the seven electors were the princes that would choose who the emperor would be. Mm -hmm. And that went back to Sumer. And now we're dealing with them too. But it's like these, these are the spirits that choose who the emperor of hell will be. They're Whoa. looking for the guy to fill that role. Usually they pick men who have had their families murdered. They have a special affinity for that. Damn. Um, yeah. Because men like that are very resentful. And I was a very resentful person. I was full of negative energy because I had failed. Like I flunked out of grad school. I was mentally ill. I had very bad uh, problems with my back, physical health problems. And, um, it's like I had done the Abramelin right, but I didn't do it correctly, you mm -hmm. know, and my angel chastised me for it. You know, he really punished me, especially when I got mouthy with him. Um, he abandoned me for a little while and they warn you that that can happen. They say, you know, you can alienate your angel. In fact, I found out later on and with a lot of the brujos, they do a, a, a bad spell. Their curse on somebody is to cut them off from their angel. That's how they go about it. Is that even possible? Well, yeah. you could fall into the illusion it's possible, and that's that makes it real. You understand? Mm -hmm. it, it, well, it's all illusion. In, in a natural state, people will just follow their angel because that's kind of what, what it's there for. Uh -huh. But the humans are the only people, the only animals that actually cut themselves off from their true nature. Mm -hmm. And if you, you can guide someone to kind of push them off, off that track, and once once the cheese is off the cracker, it's on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, 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 you you can technically cut somebody off from their angel, but they have to go through all the trouble of realizing the cheese is on the floor and trying to put it back on the cracker. Yes. Damn, yes. Man. So that's yeah, the word spot. magic is the same as the root uh, for illusion. And that's what the demons are. They're spirits of illusion. They're stuck in the illusion and they're trying to keep everybody else stuck because of this malice they still carry. And that malice has ruined their souls. And it's like when people get stuck in those loops, you know, we ruin our lives too. And I did, you know, I, I ran around with horrible creatures for years and, you know, I got violent with my own family. Like, you know, I committed a domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that was because I was under the influence of these arch demons. You know, I'm not going to blame them for it and say, oh, the devil made me do it. No, it was my fault because I opened myself up to that negativity. You know, I was so hungry for power and control. Um, so I could feel like I was the master of my own world, that I was the emperor in charge. So that's what you got to watch out for, uh, Rob. You know, I know you like that tarot card. But there's a shadow side to it too, you know. Like Very everything, aware of it. yeah. Very aware but of anyway, it. it's like uh, it's good because the fool who persists in his folly becomes wise, and that's mm -hmm. what all the Kabbalah has been about for me. Um, you know, I've had to learn to surrender because that's the thing they teach you in that system with Faust. Um, is they say there's a point in the rites where you just have to open completely, and it just says surrender to God and His will. You know, I think this is what Thelema was aiming at originally, in my humble opinion, because I wasn't in there. But the idea in Greek is divine will. What is it really? What do we really want? I I personally believe that Aleister Crowley got sidetracked. Just my perspective. I wasn't attracted to him. I, I didn't like him as a teacher. To me, I was more interested in the Christian magi, um, like Agrippa. And um, some of the other ones, like uh, Christian Rosencruz. I was in the mm -hmm. Rosicrucian movement. He wasn't a real figure, though. Like, he was a mythic figure. 
yeah he represented what had been brought back from the middle east during the crusades but it was it was fun and they had this thing in san jose for it it's not bad <laughs> yeah yeah the, the what's it called the rosicrucian temple there near my old school yeah they get yeah. they got into egypt again and i felt like that that was a distraction because the rosicrucians had their own thing going on in europe but it's okay they split into all these different groups anyway they went all their own way we even have our own branch of it here in the philippines you know that yeah yeah i know because people would come over from did they reopen the did they reopen the planetarium yet well, not I here. So. They renovated it. Yeah, I want I want to take my kids down to the uh, down to the planetarium. Mm -hmm. That'd be. Yeah, uh, well, so I thought they would like that, seeing the museum and all that. And... Yeah, it's good for the kids. Yeah. So it brings me to my next question, Dave. Like, of course, it's obvious you're pretty knowledgeable when it comes to magic and mysticism. Now, how did you start involving or entwining, or what role did comedy play in you becoming a magician? Did it help your magic? Did it turn it off was it kind of like the batman bruce wayne kind of thing that like comedian by day mage by night like what role did comedy play in you in your practice as a magician or as an occultist yeah well it was there from the start um comedy runs in families a lot and uh, my first major comedic influence was bill murray playing uh, peter venkman in ghostbusters <laughs> You know, okay. yeah, and see, you guys are busting up just at the mention of it. But that gave me a I just foundation. watched that the other day. Yeah. Well, it gave me a good, healthy way to deal with all the, the fear in my life and with the supernatural and all the issues and surrounding it. So it's like humor was there for me from the start. Humor was mm -hmm. my angel. And uh, as I worked on myself, I did the Abramelin operation, you know. I came into contact with Shamziel, uh, the angel of the sun and laughter and light and also music for that matter. Um, so that was my HGA. That's how I understand it. Now, yes. we've had our differences over the years, but I found um, Rumi's poetry and that's where I first met Sham. So when I did Avramelin, it just confirmed that they came together. So it's like I had a way with these good spirits, with these holy spirits to understand religion, to deal with my issues, to ask questions, and also to, you know, come to discernment and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been looking for forgiveness myself, but I, I don't get it very often. You know, people don't always forgive you, but God does. And it's like, I haven't had the ability to forgive the people that have hurt me um, because it's been so deep. You know, I've carried wounds for a long time, but I've done enough prayer now. I've internalized the spirit of what the psalmists were talking about that now, you know, I find myself having abilities that I didn't think I could do before, you know, to forgive my family members, myself, my friends, colleagues, especially in comedy. And, uh, you know, there's an unburdening that's come with that. I wasn't able to do that myself, though, Rob. I was too hung up. I had Satan in my head, for real. You mm -hmm. know, the prince of the airwaves. <laughs> and that's what they meant, you know? It's funny you mentioned something. I wanted to bring me to my next question, which was, uh -huh. I mentioned the Psalms. And this is an area of magic which has been kind of controversial. Some people swear by them. Some people say mm -hmm. they're useless. Um, how do you... I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not saying they're not. Um, they are. I mean, I personally believe in them. But how has the practice of the Psalms helped and augmented your practice as a mage? Um, they've helped me a lot because they have good, good spirit in them. Um, so let's see. One of the Psalms says, you know, give my feet solid ground. And that's mm -hmm. what it's been like for me. So um, like, again, I've been talking about earth and that element and needing that in my life. Um, if you look at my ast astrological chart, I don't have any earth signs. Really? None. I got a lot of air, a bunch of fire, and a good amount of water. No earth. No earth. So my part of fortune, I did the calculation, is Taurus. So that's where the money comes from, is everything Boys. the bowl represents. Solidity, yeah. um, strength, physicality, um, good materialism. Not, not like obsession, but like venereal things the enjoyment yes. of life so um i did a bunch of venereal magic rob you know i was interested because there was a whole grimoire just about it the tube of venus did you ever see mm -hmm. it no i didn't yeah. Talk to me about it. 
Oh, okay. Well, I didn't use a lot of them, but it's like I got um, a set of copper uh, copper sheets, like pretty mm -hmm. cheap. I mean, you know, it was a, a pretty penny, literally. But, um, you know, I found like three different grimoires. I just collected all the venereal spirits and made seals for each of them. You know, I and had copper. a little uh, diamond edge pen and I just etched them and, you know, I kept them. And when we came here to Coyote Valley, I put them under our place. And what's happened is we've manifested all these magnificent plants and animals everywhere. Like we have a huge orchard now full of fruit trees and it's doing really well. Like e even in the middle of the drought, which is pretty magical, you know? And, uh, you know, we also have enough money not to live luxuriously, but we're getting by. And, you know, I'm working on doing more, but uh, things have come to me, you know? Um, more health i i exercise more um i get a, more business done i have more focus so uh venus you know it's a, a feminine planet but it's brought a lot of benefits to my life so yeah let's hear it for the girls yeah all right let's hear it for him all right so now we're going to go to the john stewart segment copyright um okay. of the episode where we're going to give you as one of the guests the time to share your sentiments on the practice in your demographic. You could say as people who are comedians, you could even come from the LGBT angle, whichever one you want. But I wanna hear what do you think about the present status of occultism, magic, etc. What would you like this to, to be done better or what do you think is being done well? We wanna hear it from you. Take it away, David. Um. Well, I feel like in the last 20 years, all the circumstances that have happened have forced people to wake up and uh you know get away from a lot of the bullshit and superstitious mm -hmm. side of it so the people that are still in the game are pretty sincere or serious about it one of those you know um because a lot of people didn't have the money for it anymore let's be honest um buying all the these accoutrements and all the ritual tools you know it's so easy if you have money to just get caught up in all the claptrap and that's not really doing magic um so people would, you know, amass all these different things. They get statues and oils and herbs. I had a huge collection of oils from Lucky Mojo. And then my ex spilled them. You like spilled $150 worth of essential oils. Oh, it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, with the state of occultism, I'd say, you know, Magi are always the same in every era. They're the kind of people that are susceptible to certain things. So like I've been talking about discernment, that's a skill I think everybody needs to get down because um, otherwise, you know, you, you end up in some dark, dark places. I don't recommend that. The, uh, the shadow side of the tree, the clipo, the shells, that's what they called them. Um, like a lot of people did uh, path working down there. And sometimes it can be healing and good to like, you know, face the music and your fears. But I don't know. I think what happened now is that the people who are still into this, um, it's more of a calling now. And they talked about that in the Arbitel. They say a mage is really somebody since they're born. They're born that way. And other people will not be happy if they're trying to make that work. And I, I don't think I was born to do like grand medieval style wizardry in the way like people used to make lightning bolts and fireballs go all over the place that's not my calling you know that's a very dungeons and dragons way of looking at magic and it's childish um calling is important so like the, in the greater mysteries you know where uh, the meaning of alchemy opens up and uh, we're starting to get to the deepest parts of magic and christianity you know i had a revelation like that so like one of the mysteries in the Arbitel of Magic, it says um, to know God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. That's the macrocosm. So I had that. Um, I had that experience and it was pretty special. And uh, that spirit has stayed with me. And it's it talks about that in the New Testament. It says, you know, you, you can't make it go away. Once somebody's born of God, they can't continue to sin. They can't continue to screw up their lives. And I've experienced that because it's like I felt torn that way. I had that experience like St. Peter where he talks about the crow and denying Christ. 
And when, when we, they mean denying Christ, they mean denying the spirit of forgiveness, uh, denying that, that love, you know, questioning it, uh, being suspicious of it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. But it's like, St. Peter, you know, he said he wouldn't betray Jesus, but he did it three times, you know, it, it was human. It was just human. And it's like the power is still there. Um, people usually think of Christianity and magic as being two separate things, but not in the, the white magic grimoires. If you read those, you know, where you're dealing with angels and discernment, then you find some peace sometimes. I think that's the biggest thing I got out of these things was peace. Um, with the Psalms, with the angels, um, the prayer is um, getting my mind to stop, getting my heart to rest, and finding my soul, and knowing that's still there, and it's not going away. You know, I can ignore it, and I can push it away, but, you know, the soul, the soul has to be a part of magic. If it doesn't have the soul, it's something fucking evil, and you don't want that. That's not real magic. That's, that's, Ugh, that's the devil in my which brings me to my next question um of course i mean it's public knowledge that you're uh homosexual and i wanted mm -hmm. to ask you do you see that the practices of magic are going to further empower the lgbt community or, or do you think that some people tend to ride it as a means of just well i want to practice magic so i become more beefed up i mean how have you noticed have you observed the practice of magic as a whole affect the lgbtq movement on a global scale. I'd love to hear your sentiments on this. Okay. Well, I will say a lot of us get into it, you know, we're looking for power. Um, and it has to do with homophobia and traumatization. I internalized a lot of that, Rob. So it's like, you know, you and me have been talking privately about the spirit Satan, you know, and the role that he plays in the grimoires and stuff. And, you know, facing my fears and that, that bitterness um, you know, that's been transformational, but it's also like really terrifying too. And that's okay. That's okay. But it's like, um, uh, with being gay, that has been uh, a tool that Satan has used to make me really scared. Excuse me for a minute. No, I just wanted to make sure you had your pants on. Uh, my partner's here. He's waking up. We share a trailer together. Um, uh, oh, did this thing mute? More power. No, it's okay. Please continue. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, so it's like facing my own demons as me facing that evil spirit. So that's what what St. Paul was talking about with discernment. So it's like you have to be able to question the spirits and see where they're coming from. You know, what's their intent with dealing with you? Now, they could say one thing, but it's like you have to learn how to discern their intent that's what the sword symbolizes oh guys i want to show you this is funny i got the freaking sword <laughs> so he was telling me about a sword that he purchased from catherine ironwood so i'd love to see it on air this isn't from cat this is from truesorts.com and it was their screwed up swords collection so most swords are like hundreds of dollars but these were the nicked and dented ones, so they're 80% off. For $40, you get a sword that's got something wrong with it. And apparently, I got Squall's gun blade from Final Fantasy VIII, except it's missing the freaking gun. <laughs> well, good luck summoning demons with that one. All right, you know, well, here's the thing I want to, yeah. I want to ask you next, Dave, before I forget. This is running to my mind. Um, I remember in the early 2000s, there was an interesting movie that came out, which was called Dogma by Kevin Smith. And at the beginning of that movie, it does a disclaimer saying, I am making this movie with the presumption that God, in all his mightiness and all his omnipotence, has a sense of humor. Because if yeah. not, I am so fucking screwed. <laughs> okay, So I wanted to ask you, do you feel God has a sense of humor? Yes or no? Oh, I know he does. I am his humor. Very okay, now let's hear some of this humor of yours. Like, come on, I'd love to hear about your humor experiences. Like, tell me something, tell the people on air, if you could make it magically and inclined even better, but tell, tell us something on air that would make us laugh. Wait, would you like to hear that? I would love to hear that because honestly, laughter and humor is a magic all on its own, and I think that's something the world really needs. Okay. I have never figured out why we don't, we need to have a Nobel Prize for humor. Yeah, because why I mean, not? Science, 
Science, we can, you know, we, we get by, you know, uh, peace, we generally get by without. Why do we have Nobel Prizes for all this stuff and nothing for humor? I would the post human thing thing that kind of Jordan Carlin, okay, for that Nobel Prize. I would posthumously nominate George Carlin for the Nobel Prize oh, of humor. So, yeah. Well, absolutely. Because I mean, really, I always thought that comedians should have the the Bardic Pass, mm -hmm. where you can basically bust on anybody, and as long as it's funny, that you get a pass on it. Because uh, Carlos Mencia. What, regardless of whatever of people's opinions about him, had a great sentiment. He said, if you can't tell a joke in front of the people it's about and get a laugh out of it, then you have no business telling that joke anywhere because it's not fucking funny. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so David, come on, hear it on us. Come on, we want to hear some of your comedy. Like, okay. All right. Let's well, hear I'll it. Let, okay. Um, so I had this uh, friend... He and I were into summoning demons, you know, something to do on the weekend. And uh, he called up this uh, spirit named Marbus that turned him into a troll. Now he has gout, lives in his mother's basement, and harasses people online. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, he literally that comes Marbus in the and he asked to be turned into a troll? No, that's what happens when you fuck with Goetia. <laughs> hey, what are you talking about? Me and Wade are still okay. <laughs> okay well, so I, want to, I want to try. I want to try. I mean, come on. I don't usually do this, but I, I actually made Stephen Skinner laugh with this one. Right? Okay. The person asked me, said, Rob, why is it that you need to do so many prerequisites before you summon a demon? Like, one month before you summon a demon, you got to cleanse. Then one week, you have to fast. Then three days, you have to not have water. And you can't have sex among set times. So let me take this over. One month, I can't eat meat. One week, I can't eat properly. Three days, I can't have water. 24 hours, I can't sleep. And the whole time, I can't fuck. No fucking wonder I'm seeing, de seeing demons. I'm seeing a lot of other shit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That, that's for real. You know, that's how it was designed. And I, I have had visions like that. Um, actually, the, the Grimoire of Arnorius was very good for that because there are prayers in there to have visions of the Virgin and the Saints and Jesus. And, uh, you know, those work, you know, and I had um, I did a lot of Catholic mysticism when I was in uh, grad school because I was just curious about all of it. And it, it's a big part of the Grimoires. Like a lot of people want to shove the Christianity away when they work with magic and they're in there, which is weird because these are Christian systems. Now, yes, they did appropriate and incorporate um, things from pagan systems, you know, with uh, the holidays and the times of year, you know, it was, they adapted it into their system uh, as a vehicle for Christian teachings. But uh, the whole thing is about the spirit of it. That's why people know, what's the bullshit and what isn't these days. Like anybody who's still bullshitting about being a Christian is really obvious now because the yeah. whole planet is learning to serve it, you know? It brings me to one important point. I forgot where it was exactly written and I wanted to share this among scholars since this is a carbohydrate episode. Um, I think it was in the sworn book of Honorius and I actually asked Stephen Skinner about it. There's actually a right somewhere in there that you can summon God. Yeah, you can actually summon either God. It's like a vision of God or something. And I asked even, what do you it say? It wasn't about in the book of Honorius. Okay, you, there's Christ is in there. But, you know, straight up Old Testament God was actually in the sixth book of Moses. I'll have to look that up. But the thing is, something like I asked him, is that possible? And Stephen said, that's not enough to an ant summoning a gardener. Now, yeah. knowing that this kind of music, like, if it does exist in the sixth book of Moses, and I'm going to look that up, how the fuck, like, even if the three of us were together, how the fuck do we summon God? You know what I mean? It's like the first thing I would do if I summon God, like, you've been really on the crap pipe for these past three years. I can't understand what the oh, fuck you're doing. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> like, that's the thing. Okay. So it says, like, um, if you're going to pray, you have to do it in the spirit of truth, because otherwise it's called an ungodly prayer. And it's what you might call magically ineffective. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you go into a ritual and you got the a wrong attitude, you're doing it with bad motives. You're in a bad set and setting. You're going to have a bad trip. It's the same principle with prayer. Um, there's no point doing prayer if you're 
going to do it as a joke or if you're not serious or sincere, if you don't mean what you say, if you don't understand what you say, that's a big one because a lot of people can get enchanted with an old language and they don't even bother to learn what the words mean. They just memorize it like in Hebrew or Greek or Latin or whatever, mm. even high German, the Amish do that sometimes. Um, you know, so it's funny. one of the things in the Magus, speaking of uh, 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 that, because you had mentioned the author earlier, they had um, the guy who ripped off or Agrippa. One of the instructions in there is they have the wand with this this Latin inscription on it. But you read the instru inscription and it says, cut a green stick at midnight. It's the literal instructions. Yeah. It's the literal instructions. But people take it and they'll, they'll go and they'll get this thing and they carve this Latin inscription yes. on there. And it's all <laughs> without understanding what it means. I mean, I understand the magic of barbarous tongues and that it, it, it can, it can in, in, you know, inspire the same power in you that it, that you think it would. But it's not the same once you discover what it is and you're like, oh, son of a bitch. It just says made in Taiwan. What the, you know? <laughs> yeah. no, but actually, I wanted to get you guys' take on this. Again, since this is a light episode, if there is an actual working out there, I don't know if it was on the Book of Menarius or the Sixth Book of Moses. I read, I heard about it on Glitch Bottle, all, all um, credit to them. And I think it was somebody talking about it, like there is that ritual to summon God. And I'm just curious, how the fuck would that work? I mean, before David, I want to get your take on it. Wait, as a as a fellow, Good man, how do we summon the the, 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 the the DM? Where would you go to summon God that He isn't already? I'm just curious. Where would you do this? <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm going to go to and, and bring some bottled air. Well, you got to find some place where there's no fucking air. I, I'm I'm just curious about the whole premise of this operation. Equally. What about you, David? Okay. So, yeah, you're totally right. That is a very good question. And the whole... I mean, you can summon the vision of God. Okay. You, you, to see him and what's going God, on with it. It's for you. That's what that ritual is about. And you figure that out while you're doing it. Just like, so God is free in need. So, you know, how could you possibly have something that that vast active living intelligence, Valis, like Philip Dick talked about, you know, it, it doesn't work like that. So, yeah, the ritual is kind of a joke, but it's a joke on you. It puts you into perspective, like uh, staring up at a field of stars at midnight on flat on your back. It aligns you with reality. So um, with uh, all those spirits in the sixth and seventh book of Moses, you know, they are the real spirits. Um, there's demons in there too, but the, the the holy spirits they show you the same experiences that Moses had. So I remember when I used that one, it was like the experience of the burning bush. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, magma. Have you guys ever been near a volcano? Have you ever seen lava up close? Not up close. Okay, I, I sent by one of a volcano going off in the Philippines once. That was fun. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was uh, on the big island of Hawaii. I lived there for a year and I lived um, near Kalapana. I was dating mm -hmm. a guy there at the time. And uh, that whole town had been destroyed by lava and there were still active streams. And I camped out in Volcanoes National Park. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And uh, at night, it would glow in the dark with the lava and you could feel the warmth under the ground. And that represented something to me. So magically, that's what the inferno is, the infernal spirits. There's mm -hmm. that energy. That's the energy of passion, the snake, the nephesh. Um, but it has to be applied. It has to be used intelligently because uh, if you repress it and, or you indulge it, you know, either way, it'll run amok and it, it's destructive, you know just like Kalapana got wiped out and all these people lost their homes. So um, earth, you know, it's there. That's the liquid form of earth. Um, but also here up in the mountains, uh, dealing with that element, I just, I never had that feeling before in my life. I was always like un unsteady, shaky. Uh, mm -hmm. I lacked confidence, but now having that element underneath me, the, the footstool of God, that's, that's the old term for earth. You know, that's given me a piece. I never had doing a lot of magic before. I think that's one of the real aims and one of the gifts of these systems. So, 
you know, in the end, dealing with the Faustian demons, I'm glad to have them out of my life. Never again. Thank you very much. But because they ripped away everything that was false, I was able to find something true left over. Does that make any sense? Yes. And I wanted to ask, like, who was one of your biggest influences in these practices? Like, for me, honestly speaking, it's Franz Barden. I mean, everybody says, I look mm -hmm. like him. I'm reincarnated. I would be so lucky. But I'd like to know who was really, like, your top influence. Like, and for me in comedy, it'd be Carlin. Who would it be for you as an occultist? Occultist? Well, differently, uh, Abraham or Worms. Wow, yeah, or Worms. Worms. Yeah, because that's been my template working with Avramelin over the years. Um, it, okay, it's not really about Avramelin, though. He's just like the guy that passes it along. And it might have been uh -huh. a code word anyway. Um, Abraham means like a monotheist. That, that's yes. what they're talking about. So like a lot of people think that, you know, maybe it wasn't even really Jewish magic. Although some of the Jewish sages were interested in Christianity, like, you know, they, they were open minded about it. But it's like people want to have camps about these things when they talk history mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely translated into a Christian audience. And I think it may have even been written for that deliberately. You know, when he talks about my son Lamech and passing on something that wasn't quite the Kabbalah, but could still be useful. And, uh, you know, it is a system of Gnosticism, uh, what it comes down to. And if you do those rights, you know, you're going to face some dark stuff. It's not an easy thing to do. And that's why there's all these warnings at the beginning that says, you know, don't do this if you have a health problem, if you're too young or too old, if you're not in a good place, if you don't have a stable financial background, because all the shit is going to come up. And it does, you know, um, I, uh, you know, I had a sick spirit. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I had a sick spirit in me. You know, that's what Satan is, is um, the bitter spirit. They talk about it in the 12-step groups. They, they say, you know, um, people that are sick in spirit, we have to forgive them for, you know, hurting us. And, you know, my grandparents, they did that to me. You know, they were verbally and spiritually abusive. They, they always had to cut me down when I was around. And, uh, you know, they were hurt themselves. They, they had suffered through periods of poverty and uh, financial insecurity and uh, losing work and education, having to start over again. And it's like my grandpa was a cop. He was a, a veteran from the Navy and he had to resettle. Um, he had to, you know, do security with hippies, which is call him a pig and treat him like shit. So he had a good sense of humor that he developed to deal with that. And I've inherited part of that. And then my dad's family had that too. So, so when I did this right to find my angel, what I came into contact was divine laughter. And I was in a very dark place at the time, but do you guys remember that scene from uh, the evil dead where Which he one? just goes crazy and just starts laughing and then all the demons start laughing with him. And it means laughing with him. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the dark joke, okay? If you guys, they talk about the Grimoire say black magic and white magic. Black magic is a dark joke. That's what it mm -hmm. comes down to. If you go all the way into the darkness, you'll have that experience. You may die. You may die physically. I mean that. And you may find yourself in hell for what seems like an eternity. Um, but, you know, that apocryphal book, there was one of those that got left out of the Bible. It says, okay, so here's a secret. Nobody actually stays in hell for absolute forever. Mm -hmm. Eventually they get out, but we don't want to tell that to people because then they'll think it's okay. <laughs> Sometimes as long as you need to. That's the thing. Yeah. As long as you let yourself stay there, you need that's that's how long you're there. Someone used yeah. to tell me that no finite crime re uh, requires infinite punishment. Yes, this is true. But it, it for all practical purposes, it is an infinity. And that's mm -hmm. what's been like for me, you know. Um, I, I put myself through my own hell, and uh, I've had to face that. And so the, the process of binding the princes of hell is all about facing those aspects of yourself. So Lucifer, my spiritual pride in particular, has been a problem, gentlemen. A lot of us got to watch out for this. Because what can happen is that, like, people who are into religion or magic, you know, the devil can say to them, well, look at everything that you've accomplished. 
Look how special you are. Look how hard you worked at this. Look at all the weird stuff you were willing to open your mind to. And you committed yourself to this. <clears throat> fucking badass, you know? <laughs> and it goes from there. So spiritual pride can distract you from the true aim of magic and religion, which is the holy will, the will of God, your particular calling. That's the other uh, great mystery. That's the one I'm working on right now. So um, that lawman they have in the book for the Olympic spirits, you know, the, the seal of secrets, you know, it's directional magic. The directions are like part of the big mind and it's the, it's where they store different things. So if you know, like the North has these qualities or the East and the South do, you have a feeling for them, you know where to look for the answers to certain questions. Um, you you take a, a poise, like Castaneda talked about that, you know, a stance, an attitude, a changing direction. I got that from Theurgia Goetia, but it's the same principle. So now if you want to learn the greater mysteries, you turn eastward. And turning eastward in your spirit means going back to wisdom. That's the direction of wisdom. So pr we pray towards the east so God can infuse us with wisdom. That's the connection there. It's where the sun comes up. Yeah. There's spiritual east. You can aim towards a particular city like Jerusalem or Mecca. But it's more the direction your soul is taking. So turning east means being open to wisdom. And Solomon and Jesus both talked about that, you know, the role of wisdom that goes with magic, the sister of magic. That's what they called it. They called it that Navramelon. They said wisdom is magic's sister. So, Amazing. yeah. So I hope you guys find wisdom and may God bless you and enrich you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. All right. So for the last part of our segment, we're now moving to the occult text part of the show. And you and I were talking about something that really blew my skirt up, which was you were calling it the hummingbird technique to help manifest okay. the person of your life's Jeez. dreams. Well, I'm recently divorced, so there's a lot of vacancies. I don't think Wade wants to fill in that void. He's enjoying his life too much. So lay it on <laughs> us, David. Hell no. Okay. La Chuparosa is what it's called in Spanish. Uh, the, their name for hummingbird is Rose Sucker. It's a little different, but... Um, so the Pomo are here, a native tribe in California, and their religion, they had the, the, the rose sucker, the hummingbird as a holy figure, you know, because hummingbirds, you watch them, they're gorgeous creatures. Uh, they're symbols of God's splendor, Hod, in Kabbalah. And, uh, you know, their, their whole life cycle, the, the way they interact, um, they came to be associated with love and marriage and sex, but especially commitment. That's the interesting thing. This is the magic if you want a long-term committed relationship, like you're looking for marriage and the real deal. Because yeah, let's do it. Lay it on us. You got my undivided attention, man. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a fast spirit. You know, Barwell was fast too, but he was an asshole. So I like the hummingbird much better. Um, you basically, you can get a pink candle. Um, they have them at the candle shops. It's one of the, the well-known ones in uh, Carandarismo. And, uh, or you can, you can put the image up. You don't even need an image. Um, but basically you want to vocalize what you want the hummingbird to bring you. And, uh, there's prayers you can find online. Um, they're, they're not difficult. You can Google them, but you can, you want to come from the heart when you pray. So you can take the words, but, you know, adapt it and, and be specific, you know, tell the spirit what you're looking for in love. You know, and you'll have to be honest with yourself to really give the right answer. But the process of doing that will sharpen your vision. And then the spirit will go off and find it for you. And the hummingbird is very powerful and they'll bring it to you maybe sometimes within a few days. Yeah. Is there a particular day that you do this working, like on a Friday because it's a day of Venus? Or do you have to wear a particular color? Do you need to stack it with magical correspondences? Like, how would you, like, just as if you're doing it, how would David do it? Friday is good. I, I wouldn't be superstitious about it, but Friday has the right correspondences. So, and it's the end of the week, too, where you're getting paid. That, that's why, you know, Friday's payday. That's why it's... <laughs> connected with prosperity so yeah that's a good day to do it you could also do it on sunday if you wanted for like new beginnings you know the sun's rises it's a new week a fresh start for your life um 
you know, that was always the thing with the planets is there was lots of different ways to apply them, you know, and you can, uh, you, you could use several planets to get several things done. You guys have found this, right? If you've done planetary magic over the years, you understand that if you have a, an intent and a desire, something you're looking for, sometimes there's four different planets that can do it, but they'll, they'll do it with their own flavor. Yeah. So well, I, I think the real them. question here is, yeah. can you, can the hummingbird also make them go away in the morning? make somebody go away in the like the morning after i'm joking with you now in other words i don't think you use wade the hummingbird spirit to get laid i think no. this is more for the one you want you want to stay over no this is a spirit of beauty and grace it's not for a, a one night stand there's other spirits you can go to for that sort of thing but um this is a spirit that's very clean and pure and innocent and uh it connects people who are good at heart, I would say. So it's like, um, I, I did this ritual and then I met Augustine and he's been my partner for coming up on 10 years this December. And, uh, you know, we've been through a lot of ups and downs together. I'm not saying the love the hummingbird brings is going to be perfect and without problems, but it'll bring you the real deal if that's really what you want. Um, so let me, let me, let me. I don't think I've even had the same pair of boots for 10 years. <laughs> but let me re re enumerate it. So first, you'd want a pink candle, right? That's what you said, right? Mm -hmm. Then yeah. you could look for these. And then would you would you recommend we have like a printout of the hummingbird or we have like a sticker of the hummingbird stuck on the on the vigil candle? Would you that help? Can, but you don't have to. Um, I would say make it colorful. That's the thing, because hummingbirds are so gorgeous, and they, they represent God's beauty, um, to ferret. So you want to just have, have something there that's beautiful, a mother of pearl, um, you know, uh, a rose quartz, little things like that. I got my partner a rose quartz from uh, the Serpent's Kiss in Santa Cruz. That's the yeah, I've heard of them. There's a question asking that says, does it work on an existing partner? Yes. So... One thing you can call on the hummingbird for is fidelity. And I've done this. So, um, you know, uh, I didn't always have a good place in my relationship. And when that became a concern, um, then the hummingbird spirit comes to reestablish the commitment. All right. Now, let me continue with the process. Um, yes. You said come from the heart with the prayer, but are there any prayers or psalms that you would recommend that like, oh, no, throw in this psalm to supercharge it? Because I know you're all about the psalms. OK, so I would say Psalm 139, because mm -hmm. that's usually traditionally associated with uh, marriage, fidelity and happiness in the partnership. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is if at first glance when you look at that psalm 139 doesn't look like it has the slightest thing to do with marriage it, it's basically about acknowledging the light and the dark of life the prayer says basically that you have been up and down and but ever since you were in the womb wisdom was there with you from the beginning so this is a controversial psalm. I think this is where some of the people who are anti-abortion start to get scared because they say, well, look, the psalm says that God's giving wisdom to unformed, incomplete babies. And, you know, if you take that literally, that becomes an issue. But the idea is that wisdom is present with us since the beginning. It's not something foreign to us. So, Wade, you were talking about that earlier, um, you know, us exteriorizing qualities the virtues remember that that's an order of angels the virtues mm -hmm. they're connected with that so it, it restore it re bleh, excuse me <clears throat> it restores the natural connection and it restores our consciousness so you have a moment of zen spiritual ophthalmology i loved alan watts and it was the same thing that he was talking about but yeah um so it's like white magic and even gold magic i would call it that's magic that has the christ consciousness in it that's the magic of community mm -hmm. the community is very important abramelin talked about that he said you have to serve the community with your magic if you don't do that you're going to go crazy or you're going to go evil which is even worse and that happened to me i went crazy you guys i went full-on nebuchadnezzar i'm a cow in the field crazy for years i wandered around san jose 
um, in a uh, psychological fugue state, you know, just on marijuana out of my mind. And, uh, you know, I lived the homeless lifestyle. But, you know, that woke me up too. You know, it's been real because like San Jose has suffered a lot and people are still suffering there. And they don't have time for a lot of the old crap that we used to fall for. So it's like my magic now has to have a purpose. It has to help people. You got to serve somebody, like the Bob Dylan song says. Amen. And, Amen to that. Yeah. So well, you make your community better. It makes everything better for, for everybody in it, including yourself. Exactly. This kind of splashes out bigger. As I like to yeah. tell people nowadays, it's the church of the unholy trinity that's ruining the world. Worshippers of me, myself, and I. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, yeah. the three yeah. of us... Is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I saw this happen here in the States. When you are too narcissistically myopic about your own needs, your own wants, and you cannot see that you have a role to play in the bigger macrocosm, then you are a fucking narcissist. Okay. You have to understand that as a species, if you are dedicating your life to better humankind, then the universe will protect you. But if it's just about your mouth, your dick, and your ass, and you don't give a shit about anyone else's, then you are the disease that's destroying this world. Yeah. So and that's if you're possessed, yeah. If you're a practicing mage and you're just like, I'm doing it just to make money for me and just to get laid and just to get it's all me, 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 then you have me, no fuck. I'm yeah. sorry to say this, you have no fucking right to be practicing magic. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but you're right, man. That's 100, 100% 100 true. So yeah, um, but that's the thing. The greater mystery that they talk about in the book is your calling. So you can do magic and you ask God for your calling. And that's one of the highest forms of gold magic I say you could do. And it will come to you. Here's what happened to me. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be a comedian. So I did this, the ritual and say, okay, God, show me my calling. And when I went to visit my dad, he said, Dave, let's do an exercise. Just tell me off the bat, what would your ideal job be? And I just said, I already have it, Dad. And that's when I knew, yeah, I'm supposed to do this. That's a creepy thing, though, what you asked for, though. When people ask me for that, I yeah. warn them, do you really want to know? Yeah. Because Aleister Crowley, I think, said that if you found out your divine purpose and you don't cooperate with it that's the highest form of black magic because you're basically yeah, that's a willful disobedience to yourself at that point that's what the whole magic is you know is. your higher it's purpose calling and then doing it yeah, yeah if you know your higher purpose and you're not doing it you're basically giving god the finger and then you wonder why your life goes to shit you know, so it's like, if you didn't want to know, you shouldn't have asked, but to know these, these self-important people know, oh no, I want to know my higher purpose. I tell them, you better be damn sure, because there's no turning back afterwards. Yeah. Well, well the other thing is, it'll always be something that, that's suitable, that, that you're suited to, because you, you've you been made the vehicle of that will, mm -hmm. of, um, of that thelema, that you are created to be the perfect vessel of that. So it should be something that when you find it out, that it's very easy for you to do, that you're very good at it, and it makes you happy. And the only yeah, reason you wouldn't do it is you're fucking lazy. Into that track is, <laughs> yeah, and falling into that track is really the only that's thing that you're here for. Yeah, that's true. So that's the demon Belphegor, the demon of sloth. And, and that's the demon that inventors get. So people that are creative and can make big plans in their head, they'll get tempted by that demon because... You can just have it as velleity, which means, you know, all the wonderful things I do if it didn't actually require work. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right. Like, didn't have uh, anyone say that he was a drinker with a writing problem? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I'll share with you another thing, though. It's like, this is the funny thing. People have asked me, speaking of this whole thing about finding out your true will, your ideal job and stuff, your purpose. Um, people have asked me, Rob, if you wanted to, could you stop magic? And that was a deep question because I'm like, yeah. honestly, no, because I wouldn't want to. Like if I had all the money in the world right now, I'd probably build some wizard's tower and just spend my time there reading, ritualizing and drinking beer with Wade. You know what I mean? It's just like, okay. like actually, I'm going to share with you guys some, one, one thing. This Again, with, <laughs> since this is a carbohydrate episode. OK, right. um, for, for the tarot card, I've observed a certain hidden mystery in the Rider White deck, which is the Ten of Pentacles. Okay, if you notice in your Rider White deck in the Ten of Pentacles, 
there is the pattern of the tree of life of the Kabbalah. Okay, it's right there. It's hidden. Those who know the exoteric meaning of the card is, oh, it's wealth, it's cash. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. You know, it's cha-ching. But the esoteric meaning of it is you've got the fucking money. Now it's time to grow as a spirit, right? Because you, money's taken care of. Now, this is the thing that, that bakes my noodle, okay? With this being known that, like, you've got billionaires out there. You've got Elon Musk. You've got Bezos. These guys got more money than they know what to do with. How come they have not used their near infinite resources to try to, to, to venture to the inner space? You know what I mean? Like, if I have the money of Elon Musk, I wouldn't want to fucking go to Mars. I'd be like, well, okay, want, the matrix. Huh? Sometimes. Like, they huh? do spend it. Okay, so, like, you know, the tech guys, they'll go to the Amazon River and pay thousands of dollars to drink ayahuasca so that they can come up with new business ideas. Like That's the yeah. point. I mean, that's the thing that doesn't make sense because it's like you've already got that equation solved. Like, add another billion to Elon Musk, it's not going to make a difference. If, Like, honestly, if I was Elon Musk, I'd do the Abramelin. I, I would, because, like, what, so am I going to go bankrupt? Or I would try to, to substantiate the technology of the soul. But nobody's doing that. That's the thing that I'm wondering about. Like, what the fuck? What's your excuse, money? Okay, well, I have some compassion for Mr. Musk and his ilk, because I understand where they're coming from. Um, you have to understand they themselves are disconnected. They're lacking earth in their lives also. That's why they're so intellectual and and doing so much technology so okay we had our I'm own the idea of going to mars and invoking earth yeah that, yeah i wonder would you still be able to do the lbrp on mars properly would that, would that be like, uh <laughs> is it the hour of earth right now <laughs> what you think nobody thought of these things yeah but again, would astrology earth, still apply if you lived on mars yeah, but the balance isn't there. That's why, because when people start to say, oh, we can fix everything with technology. No, you can't. And it's like everything you fix creates two more problems. So I don't really believe in trying to engineer the world to death. I think Alan Watts had a very good point about the futility of that. So, yeah, the again, it's like having Earth there, having solid ground means that you find strength and power. But it's not your own. It, it doesn't come from the place of fear and control and need and the, the ego. Um, so we talk about these spirits as being exterior. But when you get deep into discernment, you start understanding the voices in your head. That's the devil. The, the whisperer, they call him, because he whispers shit to you and tries to hypnotize you. But it's like... As I progress with that, it's the same thing that St. Ignatius talked about in the spiritual exercises as you begin to understand. It's not just the voice, it's the intent. What is the intent behind the voice? And if the intent is good and holy, if this is a spirit that acknowledges God and says, yeah, Jesus is, was real, then that's a good spirit that you can trust. But if the intent is, fuck you, I'm here with harm, I'm here to harm you then you got to stop listening to that voice so it's like i think my grandma got infected with that you know she she had a very bitter spirit especially later in her life and you know that got passed down to me and i i indulged in that spirit for so long now and here i'll tell you they they say in the abramelin that uh the devil is always going to try to get you on religion we say whatever your religion is, the devil's going to say, "Oh, you're you're not doing it right." Um, and in the book, they say, like you know, if you're a Jew, he'll say, "Oh, your religion is dead." If you're Christian, he'll say, "What are you doing screwing around with the Kabbalah?" If you're gay, he will say, "Well, God hates you. Why would you ever presume that God would be on your side, faggot? You know, you're nothing. You know, you have no power." I had a fun bit with Bob Larson. All you know who Bob Larson is? He was like a radio preacher. He would go on. He did this live call-in show. And the fact that it was alive and you could call in, I loved it. Because so I'd get off work and I'd come home and I'd listen to Bob Larson. He was always about oh, cool. doing exorcisms over the radio and everything like that. Mm -hmm. I called in. the. I would call in and use different voices every time. And I, I had to. He started blocking my number. 
But the um, <laughs> yeah, I, I got in one time. He was going off about um, about homosexuals. Okay. And I I brought up the whole thing like I'm like I was anti-gay. I got on there. I'm like, yeah, no, all this stuff about the Bible teaches us we got to love in the spirit and not the flesh, right, Bob? And he's like, oh, that's right. And, I said, and only the spirit. Exactly. It doesn't matter if the flesh is male or female. Said, and that's exact. Wrong thoughts. <laughs> and then he cut me off. Yeah. But just for a second, just for a second, I had his ass. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing. Part of my journey has been to lose that hate, that resentment, that bitterness towards the right and the, the trauma that was done to me. I have to forgive that for my own sake to be able to move on. So from here on out, I don't judge anybody who thinks it's wrong. And, you know, that's their path. And there's consequences for that, too. But, you know, let's be honest. It's like we make ourselves vulnerable to certain diseases with our lifestyle. That's just a fact of nature. You know, now that we've finally looks like we're curing HIV, suddenly monkeypox is here. And it's just a natural fact that virus is going out of control through our community because we don't have the same structures and we don't have the pregnancy scare that comes with heterosex. So, you know, it's just a fact of nature. That's how we can be disease vectors. So, well, then yeah, again, I, like I told you in our talk last time, love is love, okay? Um, you're allowed to love any man or woman that you'd like. I mean, unless, of course, it's a little child, then I will put a bullet in your head because you'd be a pedophile. But then if you love a man or if you love a woman, that's your preference, and I love to celebrate that, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you chose your own preference. You're entitled to your own preference. And as long as respect is shown, that's how we can move forward as a species. Yeah. Well, like, and that's where a big part of humor comes yeah. into play because they're all humor is born of pain, and it's the only thing that really gets rid of pain forever. Because some of some of the best jokes I've ever heard came from mm -hmm. a place of the deepest pain. Like yeah. one of my favorite jokes about about marriage is, you know how they say there's someone for everyone. Well, I married that whole. Yeah. Well, that's true. So Wade, it's like that is alchemy. <laughs> One form of it so that's exactly. when i did the, the right to learn alchemy that was the form i got is like your humor is your alchemy it trans exactly and that's why i think you should have a nobel prize for humor because it is really the only thing that can just take everything that's bad in the world and make it at least a little bit tolerable even the yeah. littlest so, so with that being you, said is that good yeah I just wanted to say, like, everybody out there, if you're going to do magic, have a good sense of humor about it. Um, even the Necronomicon talked about that being important. So. It's funny you said the sense of humor. Let me cut you off because especially you notice that these new newbies, when they get into magic, that they are the most, like, they always start off with the constipated newbie. Haven't you noticed that? Somebody's new at the yeah. magic world. Everything must be perfect. You're not doing it the proper degree and doing your LBR. It's like, and then after a couple of years, they look like they just had a pack of X slacks. They're like, oh, fuck it already. You know what I mean? It's like they're completely deconstipated. So I agree. Humor, very important with magic. Don't be the constipated magus. Okay. Laugh. Well, okay, plus after, after you actually started you know, doing magic, you, you were talking about stopping doing it. You can't stop it. It happens by itself once you actually get that going. And you can find magic in anything, even the Necronomicon. James Wasserman wrote it. He, he yeah. wrote it after Crowley's formulas. If you look at some of the, the incantations and the capitalized yeah. letters, yeah. Ooh, it's stuff out that. of the link. Yeah. Yeah. I got that. I met, I met Wasserman. And uh, we, had a, we had a good long chat about it. But yeah, the, that's the thing is magic becomes everything. Once you've seen the machinery of the universe, once you've seen the body and blood of Tiamat, when you actually walk through it all and you know exactly where to pull all the little levers and, and strings, you can't stop doing magic because it happens all on its own. True. I mean, I like to agree with you on that when I say um, learning magic is just basically becoming a programmer for the source code of reality. Okay. In other words, once you know how to program that source code, then you'll do it naturally. It's like, okay, I have a shitty relationship, banish, invoke. You know what I mean? Banish to shit. We're, to do. we're designed to do this. To look at it, yeah. So yeah, that yeah. being said, David, this has been a lot of fun. Let's give you a round of applause again for such a wonderful, wonderful segment. I think this is exactly what we needed because we were talking about constipated mages, and I think me and Wade <laughs> here were getting a bit too 
really intellectual about our, our pursuits. It was we wanted a more lax thing. But you know what, Dave? I would love to have you again. And um, of course, if you have anything coming up, any shows, anything you want to plug, please share it right now to the people watching. Uh, we have a Halloween showcase spectacular at 88 Keys Cafe in Morgan Hill, Saturday, October 29th. Teddy Hall is going to be featuring the punk rocker comedian. He's badass. He's hilarious. It's on uh, Dunn Avenue. And uh, we hope to see you there, 7 p.m. Do you have like a podcast also where you do your comedy that we could listen to or anything we could listen to? Like you were in charge of Mutiny Radio in the past. I didn't, I forgot to tell you this. Um, Wade, that he was the guy behind, he was working with Mutiny Radio and he had his own show there along the Mission District in San Francisco. And it was like one of the most beautiful nights I've ever had. Yeah, I'm wondering if Radio Free Berkeley is still on the air because I lived in that house for a while. They actually, it was one of, uh, one of the Mo houses in the Bay Area. I don't know if you're familiar with Mo houses. Yeah, I used to be Mo's driver. But at this the one house, they cut a hole in the roof and they stuck an antenna out. And they were uh, they were just adjacent to K Fog Radio. They were like at one oh four point one or something that was right next to that. K Fog's gone now. Oh, they so, like, K Fog have, Radio. Before I forget though, is there anywhere we can tune in to listen to your comedy work or anything like that? like a website or something? Uh, yeah, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, just, you know, look up David Stolowitz. Uh, I got some good sets on there. You might enjoy. All right, let me type it in so the people can see it. Uh, YouTube. Thanks. David Stolowitz. Okay, let me just post it's that. It's small but mighty. It's growing. Yeah, so check that out, guys and girls. Um, all right. Just YouTube, David Stolowitz. So once again, now we're closing up the show. You got something you want to say to us and our viewers? Uh, peace. Especially in this day and age, I wish peace upon every one of you. And as a final message, what's your name and where are you right now? I'm David Stolowitz and this is Magic.TV. All right. Thank you very much, boys and girls. It's been a wonderful show. See you all in the next week or two. For our, We'll announce in the next week who our special guest is. So we're going to end this, but we're going to keep you guys in the chat room. Good night, everyone. And as